Mine is on. Can I just go? So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Bart. I'm a software engineer working for SiloDB. I'll be talking about um, what we're doing to introduce stronger consistency guarantees into the database uh, by implementing Raft. So f um, before we go into Raft, uh, how many of you are familiar with SiloDB? All right. So um, not that many, so I'll start by going over a brief introduction. Scylla is a NoSQL database compatible with uh, Apache Cassandra. Um, we implement the same APIs, um, and we use the same file formats. We are, however, uh, much faster. We have 10 times uh, the throughput at much lower latencies, especially the higher percentiles. Uh, the database is also self-tuning. We employ a lot of control theory and to make sure we can schedule all the different user workloads and that, that we can balance them with the internal processes that the database uh, has. Um, we use ODirect and bypass the page cache, so we do F-Sync correctly. Uh, and the database is written in uh, C++ with a lot of attention paid to the underlying hardware, which we want to feel fully utilize. So we are a Dynamo system, so um, there is no special nodes. Uh, data, a particular piece of data is replicated across a set of replicas, and the full data set is partitioned across the whole cluster. Uh, when uh, a user performs a read or write, he can specify the consistency level, which is how many replicas should acknowledge the operation before it is considered successful to the client. The data model is uh, based on tables. The tables can have many columns. Uh, there's a primary key with two components. The partition key uh, are a set of columns that uh, specify how the data is distributed across the cluster. So they determine which nodes get to handle which uh, pieces of data. And then there's the clustering key, which defines the order in which data is sorted and stored on disk. In terms of consistency, when we are performing a write, uh, the coordinator node that handles the user request is going to replicate that write to all of the replicas. We can, as I said, specify the consistency level. So if we say we want a quorum, a majority of replicas, to acknowledge the write for it to be considered successful, then we can tolerate uh, one failure when a replica not receiving the write. If we then do uh, a quorum read, um, and let's say that we only read from one of the replicas that had the data that we wrote previously, then we are going to consider the operation successfully and, successfully and we are going to return that piece of data. This provides us with some consistency guarantees, namely read your own writes and monotonic reads. And during this, this read, we are going to uh, notice that a replica was missing that particular piece of data, and we are going to um, propagate it there. We also do this in, in the absence of reads uh, by having a background anti-entropy process called repair, which periodically ensures that all the replicas converge on the same, uh, on the same values. There's a peculiarity, which is when, uh, let's say, we're doing a quorum write and two replicas fail. So only one replica acknowledges the write. Uh, in this case, the user uh, receives an error, but one of the replicas did store the new value. So repair will, in time, propagate that value over to all the other replicas in the system. So the user write failed, but the value made it into the system and it's going to be observable by future reads. Another part of the consistency model is how we deal with concurrent updates. So if you're trying to update the same key and the same column to different values, uh, how, do we, um, how do we specify which one uh, wins? And more importantly, how do we make them be commutative so that all replicas eventually choose the same values? And the technique we employ is the same as Cassandra's, so last write wins. We look at the timestamp, and we pick the value that has the highest timestamp. If the timestamps match, then we pick what, whichever is the highest value um, according to the underlying data type. This is really not a great solution because uh, timestamps don't capture intent, um, and we are also silently discarding one of the values that the user was trying to write. And the solution to this right now would be to 
make changes to the data model. So model the data as um, an appending log, uh, make all writes to be item put in, um, workarounds like that. So another um, particularity of Scylla is that it is implemented on top of the CSR framework, which is a C++ framework we wrote ourselves, but it's used by a bunch of other projects. Um, and it's used for high performance applications. So it, it imposes a thread per core design in which there's uh, one uh, thread uh, pinned to a particular CPU and only one. And that means that if you want to fully utilize your CPU, then there can be no blocking ever. Otherwise, the CPU will just go idle. Because of that, uh, CSTAR provides a set of asynchronous APIs, not only for networking, but also for file I.O. and multi-core communication. So in CSTAR, data is confined to a particular core, and when another core wants access to another one's data, it uses message passing to fetch that, that data. And we expose these APIs as, uh, in, a, in a future promise uh, API. So for Scylla, this has the consequence that um, all of the components of the request path are replicated per CPU. And also, data is, like it is partitioned across the cluster, it is also partitioned inside a node. We use the same partition key uh, to decide which CPUs get to handle which subset of the data. We use the middle bits of the partition key just to avoid uh, aliasing situations when the shard count per node approximates the, the node count in the, in the cluster. And so the reason we want to introduce um, a stronger consistency model in Scylla is trivially because it just enables more use cases. If you want to have uh, uniqueness constraints, if you want to specify that a particular email address uh, exists only once in a database, then it's really cumbersome to do that with just uh, quorum reads and quorum writes. If you want to have read, modify, write accesses where you read a value, make some decision, and uh, modify the value and write it back, you can't really do that safely in the presence of concurrent updates with the mechanisms we have right now. Similarly, if you want an update to be all or nothing, so if you want all uh, the value to be written on all the repl replicas or at none of them, uh, instead of those partial writes that we saw, then we have no mechanism to prevent that um, when that was all. Of course, we want uh, these stronger consistency uh, operations to be opt-in. Uh, we don't want you to have to pay for, for what you don't use. So Cassandra exposes this feature as uh, lightweight transactions, which uh, provides strong consistency per partition, so per key. Uh, it is essentially a distributed compare and swap. So we specify the new value, and we specify what has to be there uh, for the new write to apply. It's not really a full transactional API, and so you end up having to write your programs like you'd uh, write lock-free algorithms. So you make some modifications to some table, and then at the end, you try to update a pointer to the new data, and by, by, by having clients coordinate on this pointer, then um, you get the strong consistency properties. It is a data path operation, so we want to make it as high performance and as available as possible. And uh, finally, because of the, the way the feature works, it does require an internal read before write, so we fetch the current value and are able to match it against the preconditions that the user is specifying. So to implement um, strong consistency, typically um, res resort to consensus algorithms. Uh, consensus is the, the process by which a set of replicas reach agreement uh, over a particular value. They provide, uh, consensus protocols provide uh, consistency guarantees about um, the underlying data, and they are leveraged to implement what's called replicated state machines, where a set of replicas apply the same operations and in the same order and work together as a single coherent unit we can tolerate um, some non-Byzantine failures. So for two, two times F plus one nodes, we tolerate F failures. And a run of the consensus algorithm is typically called a round, and it advances the underlying state. There are a set of guarantees that make these protocols um, worthwhile. So that of stability. If a replica ever decides a value, then that value stays decided forever. Agreement that no two replicas should decide a value um, to different values. 
uh, validity that if we decide on a value, then it's because a replica did propose that value, didn't come up out of thin air. And um, also very importantly, that of termination, that eventually all replicas do reach uh, a decision. So how do we go about choosing an algorithm? And there are two very popular ones, um, Paxos and, and Ref nowadays, um, but there are, other, um, there are other ones. So first of all, we want to look at uh, an algorithm that's understandable. So there was a, a very famous paper that came out of Google uh, detailing their experiences implementing Paxos for Chubby. And basically the gist of it was that Paxos was a very underspecified uh, algorithm and that they have had to search all of the literature to come up with Frankenstein of a solution. So we also want the algorithm not to be too cutting edge, we want there to be some real world usage of it and some experience and, and validity. Another thing to look at is how many, uh, what's the overhead uh, of having all those replicas coordinate to decide on a value. And that's usually in terms of round trips for, um, for agreement to be reached. Another thing is general performance. How amenable is an algorithm to um, typical optimization um, techniques? And an important trade-off um, is whether there's a strong leader or whether any replica can decide a value. So if the latter, uh, then we require at least two round trips to decide on a value. This is classical Paxos or, or the new algorithm CAS Paxos. Cassandra does something similar, but they require four round trips. Uh, the other approach is to have a strong leader. So we go through a process called leader election, select one of the replicas you know, to be in charge, and then we can commit values with one uh, round trip communication between the leader and, and the followers. This is what uh, Multipexes, Raft, and Zav all do. Aside from this, there are a bunch of challenges in implementing this algorithm. So they typically rely on a, on a write ahead log uh, to order operations which takes space, and we need to find ways to uh, compact that log. Also, read-only requests typically require a full run of the consensus uh, algorithm, but we just want to read the latest value, we shouldn't have to go through that. So there are a bunch of optimizations that apply to some algorithms. Dynamic membership, having those come and go from the cluster is also a big issue. Um, the other one is multi-key transaction support. Can we extend the algorithm, or can we compose the algorithm to make sure we can have multi-key transactions. Another thing to look at is performance over the one. And finally, whether there is actually some formal um, proof of its safety. Or whether there is like a Jepson blog post about it. So uh, not surprising, given the, the title of the talk, which was Raft. Um, it is focused on understandability. It's, it uh, is a very descriptive algorithm. It is very widely used, there are a lot of implementations, and it's running in a lot of um, um, databases. Uh, it has uh, strong leadership, there is um, a leader election um, process, and for, in the context of lightweight transactions, it is going to be the leader that does that read before write and um, validates whether um, a transaction can apply or not. And for us, the fact that there is a log of operations uh, is no big deal because we can easily compact it, uh, as we shall see. So in Raft, a node can be in one of three states. It can be a follower, a candidate to become a leader, or the leader itself. If it is the leader, then it is the one that handles user requests and carries out uh, the read before write in the context of LWT and applies a new value and replicates it to the followers. It is also in charge of sending periodic heartbeats to the followers to keep them devout. And if uh, the leader becomes unavailable, uh, one of the followers will notice, will become a candidate, and will propose itself for leadership. A candidate will become a leader if it receives votes from a majority of the other replicas. In Raft, we have uh, three components. We have the main consensus module that drives all of the algorithm's logic. We have the log, which implements um, and this right ahead log, where, which is the thing that actually provides most of the guarantees um, of the protocol. And when those entries of the log are safely committed in a majority of the followers, then they are apply, applied to the state machine, which in ca the case of Scylla, the state machine is a database itself. And of course, then the client observes the data um, in the state machine. 
The algorithm provides a set of guarantees that makes it um, very understandable. So it, it, the election safety guarantee means that uh, at any given time, there is only one leader in the system. The leader is the, the only uh, replica that can append entries to the log. The raft enforces through the log matching property that if two logs, that of the leader and one of the followers, contain the same entry at a particular index for a particular term, then the logs are identical up until that point. If that is not the case, then the leader will, act, will um, send uh, whatever entries the follower may be missing, or will remove from the follower whatever uh, extraneous entries it might have. In REF, to, for a node to be elected leader, it needs to be uh, at least as up-to-date as the previous leader. And finally, if um, a log entry is applied to the state machine uh, in a particular replica, then it is guaranteed that the same entry is applied for the same position of the log across all the other replicas. This is how we guarantee that all the replicas are, in fact, working as a replicated state machine. So in raft, time is uh, in divided in terms. Um, each term is comprised of the leader election process. And um, from this, it can result that we elect, were able to elect a leader, or maybe we, we were, no node received the majority of votes. So the process needs to be repeated. Um, but time in raft is logically divided in, in these terms. So applying this to, to Scylla, um, leads us to a bunch of interesting uh, design choices. So first of all, uh, because Scylla is partitioned, there is no single node that holds all of the data. Uh, so even if we wanted to have a single leader for the whole cluster, it would be very cumbersome because it would need to contact other nodes and that actually hold the data to do the read before write and then to eventually apply the read. Uh, the right, all the while holding some logs that would prevent other concurrent operations from, um, from continuing. And it would also mean, obviously, that uh, if all the right operations had to go through a single node, it would prove to be a huge bottleneck. So what we do instead is we have as many ref groups as there are partitions of the token space. So for each token range, um, there is a set of replicas that handle that uh, subset of the data and those replicas form a raft group. So there are many, many leaders and um, many raft groups. Uh, a nice consequence of this is that we can have um, higher concurrency. So all rights go, can go to, to different leaders, to different uh, raft groups. And if one of those leaders fails, and we have to elect a new leader, there's going to be a brief period of unavailability. However, this will only affect a subset of operations. There's some fine print next to this, because um, if we have n nodes, then um, if one leader, let's say we have 10 nodes, if a leader dies, then we're going to lose 10% of our token ranges. So if a client is making random requests, then there is a 1 over n probability that it will hit um, uh, a key for which uh, the leader is unavailable. So it doesn't mean that we beat the cap theorem, we're still going to be unavailable um, under the presence of failures. Because of how Scylla is implemented on top of Sistar, uh, each group itself is going to be sharded on a particular node. Uh, so a shard or a CPU is going to handle a subset of the operations uh, of that particular raft group. This is going to impact how we organize those raft logs. So inside a particular node, we are going to have many of these uh, raft groups. Um, have here the, um, the typical raft modules, the core, the core uh, consensus module, and the log, the database. Uh, the state is going to be whatever persistent state we are going to need to keep across uh, reboots. And then the RPC module is just what we use for messaging between uh, replicates. So each shard, each CPU, is going to have an instance of all of these groups. However, shared between all of these are going to be the heartbeats module. So if a node is a leader for many groups, and there's a follower that's a follower for many of those groups, 
then we don't want to send any heartbeats. We want to coalesce the heartbeats into just one message and send just that, that one heartbeat. This is how the simplified write path uh, looks like inside a node. So we have a mutation, which is how we represent a write request in Scylla. The mutation is um, item, item potent and commutative, and a set of restrictions against which we are going to compare uh, whatever is on disk. So first, we apply some locks to ensure that concurrent operations um, are blocked. We query the database to find out what's the current value. We compare that against a set of restrictions. And if they match, then we apply the entry to the log. From there, we communicate with the followers to try and replicate that log entry. And when we finally replicate it to a majority of followers, that entry is committed. And committed entries can be safely applied to the database. So um, sharding, then, is um, where all the, the, the differences between a typical Raft implementation and this one um, are going to arise from. So first of all, you, no, you notice how we, are, we organize our Raft groups um, per node. But inside a node, uh, each shard is, uh, handles um, a non-overlapping subset of the ranges. So why didn't we organize the groups by, by shard instead? And the reason is that uh, this would lead to combinatorial explosion of state. So the metadata for all of those groups would overwhelm uh, the database. In Raft, a uh, particular entry is identified by the term that it was written in and by the index in the log file. So in uh, Scylla Raft, we add to that uh, what was the leader shard um, that entry belonged to. We are going to have to be careful with heterogeneous clusters. These are clusters where the shard count is different between nodes. And this is not a typical situation, but it can happen during a rolling restart where someone is provisioning more CPUs on their machines. And for a short while, shard count is going to be different among the, among the nodes. And also resharding, which is when one of those nodes reboots and comes up with a different shard count. So if we were dealing with a homogeneous uh, cluster, then everything is fine. Shard zero of, of node zero is going to talk with um, shard zero of some other node. And their logs are going to be exactly the same and organized the same way. If, however, we have um, different shard counts, it can be that different leader shards are talking to the same follower shard. This means that in the follower's log, uh, these entries um, are not going to, to match uh, how they're ordered in the leader uh, logs. In particular, for the log matching property of Raft, we, when, when we send the new log entry, we also send uh, what we expect there to be before. So the, log, uh, the follower can check if it does contain, if its log is up to date to the expectations of the leader. And if it's not, then we trigger that process um, by which um, the follower is brought up to speed. In this case, um, the, the follower can have entries that another leader shard gave it, and they won't match what this, this other leader shard is expecting. We could like, solve this by going over and filtering out uh, entries in the log, but it would be cumbersome. We can have a similar scenario where uh, the leader shard is talking to different um, follower shards. And in this case, the logs in the follower shards are going to have gaps in them because some of the entries went to another shard on that machine. And here is the same thing. When we're trying to append an entry, uh, the log matching property will require that we look at uh, what's in the log, and we're going to find gaps there. And the algorithm is going to assume that it's missing data. Um, so it won't work um, very well. So to solve this, we change how logs are organized. We organize them by term, because for a particular term, uh, the leader shard count is stable. And then we also uh, organize them by leader shard. When a leader restarts, then its term ends. It has to go through um, another leader election. In other words, um, whether a node is a leader or not is not preserved across reboots. This is why. Uh, if, you have, if you're changing the, the CPU count of a node, you have to go through a restart. So this means we don't have to worry about um, a leader uh, resharding in the middle of this term. And because now in the followers, logs are organized by leader shard, 
it can be that in some cases, different shards have to access the same log. So they will require synchronization. Uh, this goes a little bit against uh, the philosophy of CSTAR, where everything is partitioned. Um, but this situation is really um, not typical. So we do require some synchronization here. So finally, uh, log compaction. Uh, as I said, when entries are committed, replicated to a majority of followers, they can be uh, written into the database. At this point, um, we can compact the log and get rid of all of these committed entries. In, uh, in other words, it means that the database itself is now going to be responsible for that prefix of the log. This has consequences when we are dealing with a follower that's, that has fallen behind and needs to be brought up to date. So whereas before we could just ship the log entries over to that node, uh, now we have to look into the database state and figure out what that node is missing. Uh, fortunately, we already solved that problem. We had the same, exactly the same problem with diverging replicas. So we can use that anti-entropy process that we call repair to figure out exactly what uh, piece of data follower is missing and then uh, transmit uh, only those uh, mutations over to it. Um, there are some uh, interesting aspects to this. Uh, due to natural concurrency, it can be that uh, what we're transferring to the node actually overlaps with entries that are in the log that we are also shipping over. Uh, but because our mutations are um, idempotent and commutative, uh, no harm comes of this. And it's also the case that repair is a heavyweight process to run, so we'd like to avoid it. So if we notice that we have some followers that are falling behind, we can choose to keep some uh, committed log segments around, let's say one gigabyte worth of log segments around, just to uh, make it much faster to bring those, uh, those followers up to date. It's much faster to just send um, sequential pieces of data over. Now, the most difficult aspect of all of this is membership changes. So as we saw, um, and there will be many ref groups in a SILA cluster. It's going to be for each key space uh, it, we are going to have replication factor times the number of vnodes, which is how many uh, token ranges the, the key space is divided in uh, raft groups, so many raft groups. Uh, and raft has the restriction on the configuration changes. It uh, specifies that only one node can be added or removed from a group at a particular time. So if we want to have more complex changes, these are going to have to be implemented as a series of these single step uh, changes. In Scylla, if unless you are changing the replication factor of a key space, and uh, the member count of a group is going to remain the same whenever you're adding or removing a node. So this means that if you are adding a node to a group, you'll have to later remove one of the nodes from that group. And conversely, if you are removing a node. So we have here a segment of the key space in which uh, A, node A, is the primary rep replica for a particular token space. So it's going to form a raft group and uh, replicas nodes B and C are going to be the secondary replicas for that uh, token range. So there, these three nodes are going to be in a raft group together. And the same thing for B, it's going to be the primary replica of that particular um, token range, and C is going to be in a group with, with it, and whatever nodes com node comes next. Now, if I want to bootstrap a node D, and D uh, claims uh, a token range that falls between A and B, uh, some things are going to happen. Namely, now D is going to be a secondary replica for A, and C is no longer going to be in that uh, raft group. The ranges for which B was a primary replica for now have changed because some of the, those ranges now belong to D. And uh, because of that, now D is also a primary replica for a new token range. And B and C are going to be in a, in a raft group together with it. Out of all of these things, what's important is uh, having node D join the group of A and having uh, node C live it. Raft uh, forbids that these two operations happen concurrently, so we have to order them. And this is actually going, is, requires changes to how our uh, group membership algorithms work, uh, our existing ones. 
So before we bootstrap a node, we need to wait until the node has joined all of the groups. And uh, this is when we know that it's safe for now the other nodes to exit uh, those groups. Um, <clears throat> doing single operation at a time, uh, like Raft requires, uh, has the nice property of ensuring that the majorities of the configuration before overlap with the majority of the configuration after the change. Also, these, these, these configurations, what uh, replicas comprise the raft group, are written as special entries to the raft log. So this has the, the drawback that now bootstrapping a node or removing a node is going to be a much longer process because it requires um, consensus rounds across all of the groups, um, many of the groups in the cluster. So adding or removing nodes becomes much more expensive. And uh, finally, new nodes, uh, because they don't hold uh, the data, um, they are enter the system as non-voting members. So they can be sent uh, log entries from the leader, but they, they can't really participate in the leader election um, process. This can also hurt availability in some cases. So um, this is it for Raft, and for um, everything I've said was applying to single key transactions. As um, um, as I showed to the user as, uh, in the form of LWT. However, uh, LWT has another important constraint, which is it has a consistency level that uh, says a transaction should only apply within a particular data center. This means that our raft groups uh, cannot um, contain replicas from multiple data centers. It means instead that each data center has its own raft groups. So now we are left with the other problem because there's also a consistency level that says the transaction should apply across all data centers. Uh, so now we need to have some sort of way to coordinate among raft groups. This is uh, more work up front to support LWT, but it's actually a subset of what is needed to support multi-key transactions. So the way we solve this is by layering uh, an agreement protocol like two-phase commit on top of raft groups. So other databases like CockroachDB uh, do this. So it's a, a typical uh, two-phase commit implementation um, with the benefit of um, all of the participants, like the resource managers or the coordinator or um, the nodes that are going to hold a transaction status being fully replicated and fault tolerant because they form raft groups. I'm not going to go into details. Um, it's typical to face commit with additional uh, fault tolerance. So uh, I've spoken about how uh, external users can benefit from strong consistency, but it, the database itself can also benefit from it. One example are concurrent schema changes. So today, uh, schema change is carried out locally in whatever replica the client contacted, and then propagated throughout the cluster. This means that uh, we don't have any protection against concurrent schema changes or um, changes that are done in incompatible orders. So for example, if I'm trying to create a table uh, on one side and on the other side I'm trying to drop a user type that's used in that table, then there's really no way to order these two operations. And because they are concurrent, there's really no way to provide a good error message to the user. So this is just going to be, um, I mean, er errors in the, in the, uh, in the logs uh, later. However, if we say that, um, if we partition our key spaces, like the key space name, if we um, partition that into the cluster, then we're going to, find, we're going to uh, reach a ref group that can be responsible um, for all operations for that key space. And once we have that, then we, have, we can use LWT when we, are, when, when we are internally, when we are applying schema changes, so that they all go through the same leader, and then they are ordered, and we can provide nice error messages to the users. Another thing are range movements. Um, so currently, we can't really have concurrent range movements. We can add more than one node at a time because they can pick uh, conflicting token ranges. 
And whenever a node um, joins the cluster and picks whatever token arranges it wants, it will do so randomly. So it's not really optimal. So what we want to have is um, a strongly consistent way of um, ensuring that when we're writing a new node, that we actually give it what our token ranges will be best for the system. Like we can, we can see which nodes are more overloaded and take ranges away from them and give them to the new node. Um, <clears throat> it also means that uh, we can tell the system that we want to add uh, many nodes at the same time and the system can uh, pick tokens in a way that will make uh, those operations actually be able to proceed concurrently. Of course, they wouldn't be able to, um, uh, to be in the same ref groups, um, but you can, we could do better than, than what we have now. And the only thing is that we can't use the same partitioning approach that we could use for schema updates, because it, picking a token is a centralized decision. It applies to the whole cluster. So we could do one of two things. We can have a global group. We can say all nodes in the system belong to a single ref group, which is simple but has uh, many disadvantages. Or we could say that um, the ref group that coordinates cluster uh, range movements is formed by um, very specific nodes. So we can say that the, the seed nodes, the ones that everyone uh, knows about, are the ones that form this ref group that um, controls uh, range movements and um, token ownership. Finally, um, materialized views. Uh, this materialized view is a derived table from some base table. It is typically used to index uh, a column out of the base table, but it is different than a secondary index because you can actually um, de um, denormalize data in it. So you can include, in a materialized view, many columns from the base table. Uh, a materialized view is handled by a totally different set of nodes than the base table. And it cannot be written to directly. So when a base table is updated, the database will um, process those updates as well, will calculate the view updates that are needed to update the materialized views, and are going to send it to the view replicas. It does so in the background and in an eventually consistent fashion. This has the advantage of preserving base table availability. So if one of the view replicas is down, or all of the view replicas are down, the base write is still going to succeed. Um, we're just going to accumulate in memory the pending view updates. This can be a problem um, because of two reasons. One, we can have issues with consistency, with keeping the views um, up to date with the base tables. And it also means we ha can have issues with uh, flow control. All of those pending view updates in a base node can start to take over all of the memory. And then we need a distributed flow control solution so we are able to um, communicate that um, resource pressure over to the coordinator node, which in turn is able to slow down the client. So it becomes uh, very complex. With multi-key transaction, we could instead uh, specify that the base table be updated together uh, with the view table in the context of a single transaction. This will ensure that they are uh, kept always uh, consistent with each other and would provide um, natural back pressure from uh, the, the view replicas and base replicas to the client. And this would, of course, have to be um, opt-in because it will come as, at, a, at a performance cost. And that's it. Um, that's all I have on the subject. So if you have any questions, I'll, I'll take them now. Thank you. OK, we will. Um, so the question is um, how we support multiple workloads. Basically avoiding head of line blocking for a single slow Okay, so how do uh, we avoid head of line blocking by having a slow shard? So the question to that, um, or the problem is similar to how it uh, is handled by having different nodes. If you have a slow node, uh, you're going to have the same problem. 
And the way that it solves is by um, better data partitioning. So if the way you select your partition key is picking hot nodes, then um, you're going to have to employ a different partition key. The same thing happens with shards. So a good partition key is going to ensure that all shards are balanced and doing uh, roughly the same amount of work. If you have a hot shard, then there's not much we can do about it. It's like having a hot node, and it's up to the user to tweak the, the partitioning uh, key. Make sense? So if the number of lightweight transactions come in for keys in a single range, it prevents the progress of the transactions No. So uh, I didn't mention that, but uh, when I was showing the request path and we were taking locks, so there's an opportunity to allow a lot of concurrency there. So if we're talking about different keys, then they will take different locks, and they will be able to progress independently within um, the node. Any other questions? I don't think so. Okay, thank you. Mm.